Hi, my name is Dr. Dawn Bowdish. I'm a PhD scientist at McMaster University and the Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity. I also study SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. I've been asked a lot of questions from parents about sending children back to school, so I decided to make this video for you, hoping that will answer some of those questions. I would like to start it with a caveat that this uh, information I'm giving you is current as of September 3rd, 2020, and for my local area. But of course, if you're watching this from somewhere outside of Ontario, Canada, things might be a little bit different, including how your, your region is delivering education and what your regional infections look like with regard to SARS-CoV-2. With that caveat in mind, I'd like to try to answer an important question for you. Can schools be opened safely? The answer, of course, is very complicated, and the information and decisions we make today may not be relevant tomorrow as things change. But as of today, the answer is yes, we can open schools, but we need to be extremely vigilant about symptoms, even mild symptoms. We'll have to be adaptable when we find that there are infections uh, in the schools or if our local region has a lot of infections, and we'll have to make major adjustments to how school and, and a run and education is delivered. In today's talk, what I want to address is this idea of vigilance, how we're going to have to be really tuned in to the unique spectrum of infections that children have versus adults, and how that will help us keep our kids safe and keep schools open for longer. Throughout this epidemic, Canadians have had a great advantage. We've been behind other countries in the first wave of infections, so we've been able to watch and to learn what works and what hasn't worked. So on the right hand side, you can see the countries Israel and Sweden. They made minimal changes to how they run their schools, and as a result, they had evidence of spread and major outbreaks. On the left hand side, we have the countries that successfully opened school and saw limited in evidence of increased transmission. We know that doing nothing like Israel and Sweden is not a good option for us. Unfortunately, it's difficult to know exactly what the right decisions are since each of these countries made different decisions about how they were going to reopen schools. Some did temperature screening or other screening for infection. Some were very vigilant in mask, mask use, others weren't. Some had lower class sizes. Some were very vigilant about keeping students two meters apart. Some had staggered schedules. Some allowed older children, but not younger children. Some allowed younger children, but not older children. And some had very strict cohort rules where they only let some students in each day of the week. To understand infection risk, we actually have to understand a little bit about how these viruses are made. On the left, we've got SARS-CoV-2. And in the middle, we've got two viruses that share some properties, influenza and the virus called RSV. On the right-hand side, we've got two viruses that cause the common cold, rhinovirus and adenovirus. So when we look at SARS-CoV and, and influenza and RSV, we, know, we can notice that they share a common property. They have a membrane, the outside of which is made up of lipids or fats. This told us two things right away. The first is soap would be in a very effective measure. Just as you use dish soap to break down the fat on your food, the soap that we use to wash our hands will break down the fats that surround these viruses. It also tells us that alcohol will be an effective, effective disinfectant because lipids are susceptible to that. But we made one mistake. We assumed that SARS-CoV-2 would be transmitted in liquid droplets that we cough, sneeze, or speak moistly with in the same way as influenza and RSV. Here I've got a picture of somebody sneezing. So when this person sneezes, or when any of us sneeze, we release a number of droplets. The big droplets are the ones, because they're governed by gravity, just like everything else, that come out of the air first. And the little tiny droplets are the ones that go the farthest and spread the most. We thought at the beginning of the epidemic that SARS-CoV-2 would be a little bit like influenza, and it would have to sort of exist in these medium-sized droplets. One of the properties of this virus that's been problematic is it can survive in these really, really tiny droplets. These are the droplets that move farther, but they also, on the bright side, are more likely to dry up. And once the virus dries up, then it, it becomes inactivated and can't infect anymore. To become infected, you generally need to be exposed to 1,000 viruses. One virus isn't enough to do it. In one of these larger sized droplets, we can have hundreds of millions of, of viruses. And so being close to somebody who's coughing or sneezing and releasing large droplets is sufficient to get you infected very quickly. In contrast, the, number, the amount of virus that can exist in one of these very tiny droplets is a little bit lower. And as a consequence, you will need to breathe in multiple droplets 
to get enough virus to give you one of these infections. And so you can see why this two meter distance is so important. If you're outside of that two meter distance, the likely of picking up enough of these droplets from one cough or sneeze is low. If you're close, then the likelihood is very high. When we cough or we sneeze, we release a lot of droplets and they go a lot farther. When we breathe, we, re we only release those really fine small droplets and they don't go nearly as far. And this has important implications for our risk of infection. If we cough or sneeze, we produce so many of these viruses and they travel a long ways. If we sing or we shout, we also have an increased risk of infection. And this is why there have been a number of outbreaks associated with choirs, weddings, funerals, nightclubs, anywhere where we sing or shout together. However, if we're talking and breathing, we don't release as many of these uh, droplets and, and they don't go as far. And so for this reason, we know that if you're in the presence of a symptomatic person who's coughing or sneezing, your chance of becoming infected within five to 15 minutes is great. If you're in the presence of somebody who's uh, not coughing or sneezing, you need to have some face-to-face -face contact for a little bit longer, probably 45 minutes. And if you're just breathing in the same room as somebody, you have your likelihood of getting infected is not high unless you spend a significant amount of time with these people. This is an important distinction because symptomatic people are the ones who are going to be producing a lot of these droplets. Asymptomatic people are going to be talking and breathing. And as we go through the rest of this talk, I think it'll become, it'll become clear that this is an important distinction. I'd also like to point out that these estimates of how long you have to be in contact with someone are all based on studies done without masks. And in truth, we think if you and the other person have a mask, this risk is going to be much reduced. Before I go into work at the lab, I have to sign off that I don't have any of these symptoms. I also get my temperature checked, and if I were to be half a degree higher than normal for me, I also wouldn't be allowed to go into work. And this is an effective way of keeping symptomatic people who would be coughing and sneezing and at a higher risk of sharing those germs with other people out of the workplace. Unfortunately, some of these symptoms don't seem to translate quite as well with children. So in a very interesting study done in Korea, where there was households of people where one adult was sick, they wanted to study how often the kids got sick and what that illness looked like in children. And what was intriguing is despite the fact that they were all looking for infections, expecting the kids to get infected, they predict that over 90% of the kids would have been missed by a teacher, clinician, or a parent because their symptoms were just so mild. In fact, what they found is that 22% of the children were truly asymptomatic. They had no symptoms whatsoever. And in the remaining, slightly less than 80% of the children, these are the symptoms that they had. The most common was a mild fever, half a degree. And if I'm truthful with you, many parents would miss this because kids don't often have a lot of symptoms when they have such a mild fever. They also had a cough. And unlike adults where we're told to expect a dry cough, a lot of them coughed up sputum or mucus. One in four of the kids who had symptoms had a higher fever, a runny nose, or a sore throat. One in 10 kids had headache, diarrhea, or loss of taste. And infrequently, there were kids who reported things like body aches, abdominal pain, nausea, and otter symptoms that you probably wouldn't associate with a COVID-19 infection like eye pain. You can see how this is extremely problematic. Most of these children would not have raised the suspicion of their teacher, their parent, or a doctor because they didn't have sort of those quintessential uh, symptoms of COVID-19. And in fact, their, their symptoms were also often quite transient. We now know that children do carry as much of the virus as an adult when they're sick, but because one in, uh, one in five of them are asymptomatic and the rest of them tend to have more mild symptoms, they tend to fly under the radar. Why do children spread less? Well, simply because fewer of them develop a cough. One in five will be asymptomatic, and of those who do develop symptoms, one in three will have a cough as opposed to two in three adults. This means that they're less likely to produce these lots of particles, and we can probably spend more time in their presence, especially if we're all masked safely. Now there is an extremely important caveat that I want to share with you because all our data so far comes from parts of the world that are not currently or were not currently in their cold and flu season. Canada and Ontario and my city Hamilton are preparing for a second wave of infections 
And for some reasons I'd like to explain to you now, we actually predict that we may see more uh, spreading during the second wave. So to understand this, let's go back and look at this picture of these viruses. So here we have SARS-CoV-2, influenza, which is a common feature of our common flu season, and RSV. We also have these two uh, cold and flu viruses, rhinovirus and adenovirus. And remember that these three viruses have some similarities in that they are spread in very similar ways and they have this lipid membrane. These two viruses do not. Canada can learn from Australia, which is in the middle of its cold and flu season. What we're looking at here is in the gray, the historical rates of influenza that have been seen in the years 2015 to 2019. And you can see that in Australia, Australians tend to have a peak around now. Now let's look at what those rates look like in 2020 in the red. And you can see virtually no influenza. Here's another influenza virus, same story. Normally you'd be expecting high rates of influenza in Australia at this time of year, but now nothing. All of the measures that we're taking to protect us from SARS-CoV-2, the masking, the hand hygiene, the soap and water, the social distancing are also protecting us from influenza because it's spread in a very similar way. Although I will add the caveat that Australians were particularly careful in getting vaccinated this year. So this is no doubt also helped. Now let's look at two more viruses. Here we have RSV, which shares some of those properties. And again, normally it would be quite high at this time of year, and it's quite low right now. Human metanumovirus, another one of these lipid covered viruses, same story. It sounded like a good news story until what I'm about to show you now. Now, looking at those other viruses, the adenovirus and the rhinovirus, which have properties that are different from influenza, RSV, and metanumovirus, you can see that normally these viruses would also be peaking at this sort of time of year. And you can see that with adenovirus, we're not seeing a decrease in those infections. Let's look at rhinovirus. The first thing you need to look at is the scale. Look at how many rhinovirus infections there normally are. So normally quite a few. This virus doesn't have quite the same seasonal peak, but you can see these are the rates uh, for 2015 to 2019. And look how high they are now. In truth, this could be due impartially into increased testing, but it, what, what it does tell us is that the measures we are taking to prevent SARS-CoV-2 can protect from those related viruses, but they do not uh, provide additional protection against these adenoviruses and rhinoviruses. And this may ultimately influence how SARS-CoV-2 spreads this cold and flu season. So let's call this child child A on the left. Child A is infected with SARS-CoV-2, but they're asymptomatic or they have very mild symptoms. And on top of that, maybe this child is being an exemplar and wearing masks and doing good hand hygiene. This kid will be in the breathing and talking class of, of particle release, but not in the coughing, sneezing class. And hopefully the measures that we have in place, the distancing, the, the mask wearing, the hand washing, the increased vigilance will keep this kid from spreading the infection. The phrase we like to use is that these kids bring the infection to school, but they don't spread it at school if we do everything right. Now, unfortunately, let's imagine a world in which this kid gets both SARS-CoV-2 and the rhinovirus. Rhinovirus is notorious. It loves to co-infect with another virus. Having another virus present is where it likes to be. So now all of a sudden this child who was asymptomatic or had incredibly mild symptoms is coughing and sneezing again. And unfortunately we know that our masks are good at protecting from a lot of droplets, but nonetheless, when we cough or sneeze, things can come out of the top, the bottom or the sides. So now we've transitioned this child to being a child who was at a very low risk despite being infected to being a very high risk. And for this reason, we need to be incredibly vigilant and we need to make sure that we don't allow symptomatic people, even if they're not uh, normally going to spread the virus, they may become more likely to spread the virus when they have an infection like rhinovirus on top of it. So what's priority number one? We have to keep symptomatic people out of schools until we know they're not carrying SARS-CoV-2. So if I had my way, just as before I go into the lab, I have to be screened for symptoms and I do uh, a temperature check. I would prefer that children also be screened uh, for symptoms. There's a lot of controversy about how useful looking for a fever is, especially because we're looking for a very low difference. 
Uh, the good news is children tend to spike fevers faster than adults, so I am in favor of fever testing. Any symptoms, no matter how mild, have to get tested. Remember that the Korean study with those children who they were expecting to get ill would have got missed because they had weird symptoms or symptoms that didn't trigger anyone's suspicion that they were had anything serious. So you either need to get tested and make sure that you're negative to SARS-CoV-2 or your child is, or wait until those symptoms resolve because if they're coughing and sneezing, they're increasing the risk of infection. Another tip that I always tell parents is we often send our kids to school with Tylenol or ibuprofen because we don't want them to, to feel unwell. This unfortunately masks symptoms. And in fact, one of my colleagues has studied uh, influenza infections and finds that some of the spreads and some of the deaths are due to the fact that we take a pill and we carry on with our life. Don't send kids who have needed them because that's masking symptoms. However, there's no reason why you shouldn't make them more comfortable while they stay at home. And certainly I would give my kids Tylenol or ibuprofen if they weren't feeling well. In contrast, allergy medicine is great. So if your kid is responding to their allergy medicine, that pretty much tells us that they're not, uh, that they're not sick with another infection. However, uh, kids who have allergies and are coughing and sneezing and they have that SARS-CoV-2 virus, again, would be a bit of a threat. Unfortunately, we're all gonna to have to prepare our workplaces for a lot of absences this cold and flu season. There's no way to get around this. We have to be very vigilant and keep children who have even mild symptoms away from school. And as a result, a lot of parents are gonna be inconvenienced. This is going to be exceedingly difficult. And I can't stress enough the importance of masks, distancing and hand hygiene. And in fact, in my next talk that I hope to give to you uh, sometime shortly, I'll be talking to you about ventilation concerns and other strategies to keep infections low in schools. Thank you for listening. I hope it's been helpful. I've attached some more references to, that you can use to read a little bit more about this. I've also uh, uploaded the slides to my website, www.bowdish.ca. If you'd like to use them for any purpose, you are more than welcome to. I'd like to wish you the best of luck making this difficult decision to send your children back to school during cold and flu season. And to quote Bonnie Henry, be kind, be calm, and be safe.